We're in a new series called Where Are You? And thank you, Lewis and Amy, for kicking off the series in such strength and health. Well done. <clears throat> when God asks people questions despite being all-knowing, it's not for his own benefit, but for ours. So the question has to be asked, why? Here's four thoughts of why. Why does God ask you and I questions? First reason I believe that God asks this question is self-reflection. He causes us to be self-aware and to reflect on the state of ourself. Self is an interesting thing because self gets a bad rap, right? We're meant to be selfless. We don't want to be selfish. Yet, we're met with this tension of we still have self. What do I do with myself? And so God asks us questions to self-reflect. Where am I? Where is my, my self located? And so by asking questions, God encourages you as an individual to reflect on a few things. He, re, he asks questions of you either through his word or through prayer or by his Holy Spirit to reflect on your actions, to reflect on your thoughts, and to reflect on your motivations. So where are your actions at, your behaviors? Where are your thoughts at? What are you thinking about? What are you dwelling on? Maybe God's asking you questions today to snap you out of a certain pattern of thought that's not healthy for yourself. And what are your motivations? An interesting thing about humans is that we can do the right thing, but do it from the wrong motivation, and therefore cancel out the action. So he's asking us deeper questions today of our intention and our motivation. Self-reflection is really important, and God asks us these questions so that we can have a greater self-awareness. Because the person that's going to sabotage your life the most is not the person that you're currently blaming, it's yourself. Yeah. I, cannot, I cannot be responsible for someone else's actions, but I can only be responsible for mine. I cannot control what someone might say or think or do towards me. I can only control my reaction to that. You know, something I've learned about fathering is that what a household needs is a non-reactive presence in the home. Yeah. One of the greatest things you can do as a parent and in any relationship is be non-reactive. So your initial response as a dad or as a mom or as a friend or as a single person or as a roommate is to be non-reactive. That non-reactive presence can change the whole dynamic. And so God asks us questions to be more self-aware. Do you realize that your reactions are causing more harm than the thing you're reacting about? And that's most of the time. The thing we react about is actually not that bad, but our reaction can cause way more damage than the thing itself. And so, you know, one of my, my boys who I love, they drop something or they make a mess we can clean that up, it's no big deal. But my reaction can do a lot more damage than the mess. And so it is in relationships. Someone makes a mess in your life. Someone creates a mess. But your reaction can make a far deeper impact than the initial mess. So let's be a non-reactive presence in people's lives. Genesis 3 verse 9 God asks Adam, where are you? That's obviously the, the main theme or, or scripture of this series. It says, but the Lord God called to the man, 
where are you? Genesis 3, verse 9. He's causing Adam to self-reflect. God knew where he was, but Adam forgot who he was. Second thing that might be the reason why God asks his questions is dialogue and relationship. Questions foster a sense of dialogue and relationship. God wants connection with you. As simple as that. If I want to engage with my kids, if I want to engage with Georgie, asking a question is the easiest way to connect. How was your day? How, how did that go? How are you feeling? These questions create connection. When you don't ask someone a question, the assumption could be that you're not interested. And so therefore, God is not asking you questions to get you in trouble. He's asking questions to connect. It's um, something I noticed in my own life growing up. When my parents would ask me questions, I would sometimes get defensive because my assumption was, oh, they're there's some sort of agenda and I see it now with my own sons hey like what's going on with this I actually just want to connect and be interested but they might see it as like you know I'm, I'm out to get them so but that's them learning that my reaction and my response is loving I'm actually just wanting to connect and so those obviously that reaction thing is also very important so that they know we are for them and the same for your reflection on who you think God is. What I've found is that when God asks questions, we're so used to listening to the condemner and the accuser of the brethren who asks us questions in a different kind of way. And so we misunderstand God's voice and the enemy parades around with a God-like voice sometimes. He's, he presents himself with the word of God. Remember, he asked Jesus questions uh, in the wilderness. He, he questions the identity of Christ himself. And so not all questions are from God. So we have to decipher, decipher him. But sometimes because we're used to the accuser's voice more than God's voice, because we haven't acquainted ourselves with the Father's voice, we can end up being reactive to God's questions when actually he's just wanting to connect. And so we're used to the, the condemnation, self-talk, or the condemnation from the enemy that we can end up pushing away the questions we actually want to engage with. Isaiah 1 verse 18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. I love this because... The Lord's causing or asking the people, come on, let's reason together. Let's talk about this. And then he follows it up saying, hey, I'm aware that your sins are crimson. I, I'm there. You are guilty. But now let's just understand that they're going to be white as snow, that they're going to be washed clean. So the premise and the foundation for which we engage with God needs to be from a place of mercy and grace that he's a God that covers and he's a God that forgives. So therefore, he's not engaging with us based on our sins. He's engaging with us based on his sacrifice. He's engaging with you based on his love. So therefore, we can experience his presence, not his judgment. We live in the age of grace. We live in the nation. We have citizenship of a nation called grace. So we are citizens of this nation called grace, which means we can relate inside this kingdom, this dominion of love, based on what he's done. He's a king that lays down his life for us so that we can have relationship with him. So don't push him away. When he says, let's reason together, engage with that. For maybe he has good intentions for you in this conversation. Many times we don't engage with his word or prayer for we are afraid of what we may discover about ourselves, which is that we are sinful, that we are fallen, but we forget the second part is that they are now white as snow because of what he's done. The third thing of why God may ask us questions is 
a revelation of truth. Questions can help reveal truth to individuals. So through our responses, we can come to an understanding. Have you ever answered a question and you had a realization as you're answering the question, oh, that's where I am, or that's what I like, or I didn't realize that, because there's something that comes from deeper within. Really the barriers are, are, are pushed down, and all of a sudden you have a realization of truth. Yeah. Or your answer locates truth itself, yeah. as in you realize I am fallen, or I, I am in need of a savior. I, I, I am struggling. My emotions are an indicator of I need to come back to the truth. So. God is questioning us so that we would come back to his truth because truth is what sets us free. In Job 38 verse 4, it says, where were, you, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. <laughs> what a question. See, in our suffering, in our pain, we can forget how small we are we can forget because pain if not dealt with in the right way can elevate our selfish needs way beyond where they should be so we become so self-involved so self-important that we end up starting accusing others gossiping about others victimizing ourselves and then telling everyone else it's their fault and, and God even to the point where Job is is struggling with the reality of who he is in his own suffering. And understandably, it was a horrific thing that he went through. But God had to remind him, hey, where were you when I laid the foundations? See, you, if you want to describe, here's the thing. If you want to discover, bless you, if you want to discover truth, like if you really want to know truth, you have to have a true perspective of yourself. Yeah. Where were you when he laid the foundations? If, if you're so self-involved that you, you think through every question through the dynamic of ego or the dynamic of self, you won't discover truth. It's, it's one of the most dangerous and, and horrific and sad things about self is that you're missing truth because you're too big. So a great thing is just to reflect on the power of God that by his word he spoke light and light, was, light exists. What can you create? You can hardly draw a stick figure. <laughs> few of you are artists and but it's really interesting right like you you create something or you 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 build something or you make something you can start really thinking wow i'm pretty good you, you, you do a project you have a creative journey you build a team you you start to think quite highly of yourself and then that creates this reality of well i deserve certain things and it's one of the most dangerous things. You're, you're getting further away from the truth than you realize. Wow. The truth is we're nothing without him. Yeah. The truth is anything good that I do comes from him anyway. Yeah. The truth is everything good comes from him above. And so if you start to think of yourself more highly than you ought to, you, your relationships also start to break down. Yeah. That's why Philippians calls us, think of others better than you think of yourselves. That's the attitude of Christ. If Christ, the creator of all things, practiced this while he's a human being, how much more should you think of others more highly than you think of yourself? Right? Like that is, that is what, like God himself practiced that. So this is incredibly important. Truth will always be hidden to the person that thinks too highly of themselves.
you, it's, I've seen it time and time again that we miss the truth of who God is and the truth of what God is trying to teach us because we think too highly of ourselves. One of the most dangerous things. And the fourth thing of why God might ask us questions is what I would call teaching moments. God's questions often serve as teaching moments. They guide you to discover lessons and insights just between you and him. So there are things that God has taught you that you've never even learned from anyone else just being something that God's questioned in your life and you've discovered through the word of God and through prayer and it can be confirmed by leaders and pastors and and that's the powerful thing is that God let me let me say this that God uses other people and voices to get his questions across to you so teaching moments are yes in prayer and in word but often they are confirmed and cemented by leaders or people on your team or others around you, loved ones, are going, hey, how are you going? What's going on? And those questions are really God using the voices of others around you to confirm something he's already shown you, but maybe you haven't yet surrendered to. You know that, it's a really funny thing, like, you know that, thing that's calling to you like that still quiet voice to maybe change that certain thing in your life but you're resisting it the more I resist it the more I find voices pop up to confirm that thing anyone like me and it keeps showing up in these different ways in in voices around my world and sure enough you know you resist them you're like no I don't know what you're talking about what do you mean? And those, those non-teachable moments are just slowing down the potential of your life. The quicker you can lean into those questions, the quicker you can respond to that character development. See, here's what I've discovered. Even if someone is wrong, I am, have the opportunity to grow if I respond to their teachable moment. I, I've been accused wrongly, I've, de- I've been all sorts of things, but I've responded in a way that's repentant, even when I felt like it was not justified. Guess what? I'm the one that gets the blessing. That's the power of humility. Even when someone else is wrong, yet you take the path of humility, you're the one that grows. It's, look at Jesus, wrongly accused, falsely accused. The cross was the way to the resurrection. So even if something looks like it's going to kill you, you're the one that actually wins. That's the power of humility. That's the power of understanding surrender. And that's what it means to pick up your cross. It's going to feel like you're sometimes wrongly accused, falsely accused. It can feel like it's not justified. But I'm telling you right now, that is the pathway to true life. If you always, imagine getting what you want all the time. Getting your way, doing things your way, you're gonna be the most stunted person on the planet. So you wanna be very careful of trying to get it your way. You, you will not grow. Now you'll get your way, but you will not grow as a human being. The only way to true growth because of your sinful nature is actually to not get your way ironically think about it the the times you have not gotten your way are the times that you have grown the most because your attitude has to shift you've had to rise above the the uh, the discomfort that's what's grown you the most when you get your way and you exit and you do things your your way sure from the outside, oh wow, look, their life looks so amazing, but internally you're rotting away. There is no character in someone that always gets their way. 
So it's, you've got to be really, really careful. So what, what, what's the way? Now, it doesn't mean you won't, God won't do things for you, but the way he wants to give you something is just as important as the thing itself. Does that make sense? So think about Moses. He, he's like, I don't want to move forward unless your presence is with me. God said, I will give it to you. I'll send an angel ahead and I will defeat and, and give you the promised land. So God is, God is really tricky sometimes because he will give you the blessing. He will defeat the enemies. And yet his presence is not with us in, in the way that he wants to be with us. Yet we can actually trick ourselves into thinking he's with us because we have blessing. Did you know that blessing is not the confirmation of his presence? It could be part of the equation, but that can't be true because, again, the cross, again, suffering, again, Job, again, David. Look at time and time again. It was God's presence in the suffering, God's presence in the pain, God's presence in the pathway that did not look like it was going to go their way. God was there in a... In, in amongst that so jesus asked peter in john 21 15 to 17 three times if he loves him these questions helped peter reaffirm his commitment and understand the depth of his relationship with jesus so jesus was asking me a question saying i know you've made a mistake and you denied me three times but i know that your love for me is actually deeper than what you just did he wasn't just asking him because Jesus was worried that he loved him or not. Jesus wasn't insecure. Jesus wasn't like, Peter, do you love me? Like, do you? <laughs> he was asking Peter to pull out what he knew was there, which was Peter really did love him, but his old self got the better of him. So God is not asking you questions to make you feel bad. He's asking you questions to truly pull out the true self the new identity, the new creation inside of you. So, questions are a tool, God's questions are a tool for personal development, spiritual growth, and deeper connection with him. Let's not run from his questions today. Let's run towards them. Let's lean into them, and let's embrace it so that we would grow and become stronger disciples for Jesus. Amen.